The CRTC wants to know how radio, TV, and digital platforms in Canada can best meet the needs of Indigenous viewers, listeners, and content creators. Join the conversation today at crtc.gc.ca slash indigenous hyphen broadcasting. A message from the Government of Canada. Le CRTC veut savoir comment la radio, la télévision et les plateformes numériques au Canada peuvent mieux répondre aux besoins des spectateurs, auditeurs et créateurs de contenu autochtone. Joignez-vous à la conversation aujourd'hui au crtc.gc.ca par oblique radiodiffusion Trédignon autochtone. Un message du gouvernement du Canada. I'm Rick Harp. This is your APTN News Brief for Thursday, June 13th. The government of Manitoba is set to begin its search of the Prairie Green landfill for the remains of at least two Indigenous women. Premier Wab Kanu made the announcement Monday after a meeting with family members. It comes on the heels of the Jeremy Skibitsky trial, a man who's admitted to killing both women as well as two others. With more, Sav Jonesa. Plans to search the Prairie Green landfill began several months ago, says Manitoba Premier Wab Kanu. His government approved a special environmental license to get things going. Kanu says the search will be conducted in a different way than what was proposed in previously released feasibility studies. We're doing so for two specific reasons. One is that we've made a significant advancement in terms of identifying where we believe the remains are within the site. And the second is that we have found what we believe to be uh, a better approach to searching the landfill material. Kanu says the trial of Jeremy Skibitsky provided a clearer picture of where the remains are likely to be. And they are actually um, closer to the middle of these cells rather than closer to the surface. Kanu says they will need to excavate the top layers to get to material dumped on May 16th, 2022, when they believe the remains were deposited. This will now be done manually rather than through a conveyor belt system as originally proposed. The reasons why we're proceeding with this manual search is that after having our team and our experts look into this, uh, we've concluded that this is going to allow us to move forward in a much more robust fashion with a more thorough search with less downtime. If we use a conveyor belt system, if the belt breaks, the whole search comes to a stop. And we're trying to avoid that. The families have been forced to wait long enough. Landfill searchers will be hired throughout the summer and receive extensive training. He says no new funding will be provided on top of the combined $40 million the provincial and federal governments has promised. But he says it will be enough. He says the search could realistically continue into 2026. Canoe wouldn't provide comment on if the Brady Road landfill will also be searched. Sav Jonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. And the Federal Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations says he's pleased to see the landfill search moving ahead. On Tuesday, Gary Anandas Hangari tweeted, quote, Permits are in place. We are going to keep pursuing justice and healing with the families, communities, and Manitoba. The landfill will be searched, unquote. The minister was also critical of Winnipeg police for their decision to not do the search. During a media scrum, Amanda Sangri was asked about the landfill search and concerns police expressed about their ability to carry one out. And it is important that police discharge their duties uh, in a manner that, that is, um, you know, that they're charged with. In this particular case, uh, they didn't feel that the search was uh, required. Uh, but I do, I do think it's important that the search is done. Uh, so I do believe that uh, in this case, the, the police um, could have done the search. And, and I think for, uh, for the family to go through this traumatizing experience over the last year and a half, I think it's, it's quite uh, problematic. So I do believe um, that we're in the right place right now, and, the, and hopefully this will have uh, some closure for the families. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs commended the province for moving ahead on the landfill search. But the Assembly said both they and ISN Masqua, the company which carried out feasibility studies into a search, must be included in order to safeguard its integrity and to honour the family's need for answers. Still with the AMC, one of three partners behind a new study just published in the International Journal of Child Abuse and Neglect. A partnership with the First Nations Family Advocate Office and researchers at the University of Manitoba, the study found First Nations infants have a significantly high rate of involvement with child and family services. C.R. Bettens has more. 
New research from the University of Manitoba paints a dim picture of First Nations infants in the province's CFS system. Data on 47,000 First Nations and 169,000 non-First Nations babies from birth to age 5 between 1998 to 2019 was studied. One in three First Nation infants, or 36%, had an open CFS file more than four times higher than non-First Nations infants. 9% of the First Nations infants were placed into CFS custody, seven times more than non-First Nations infants. At-birth apprehensions from First Nations families were six times higher than the others. Lead researcher Dr. Kathleen Kenny said the study gives much-needed clarity. I think the power in these data that we're we're using for this study is that we're able to look at rates at a whole population level. Um, So we're able to say that this percent of the population, that one in three First Nations infants born in our study period had CFS involvement. And those kind of numbers have not been um, shown in prior research in this area. The rate of CFS contact with First Nations infants grew by 22% over the same study period. For non-First Nations infants, that growth was just 2%. As Chief Betsy Kennedy of Warlake First Nation explains, First Nations children lose more than familial bonds when they're apprehended by CFS. They can also lose their culture, language, and identity. I'm sure that they would feel that this is not their life, you know, having been taught a different way of life. Um, you know, They would think that this is not their life, but yet, you know, the parents and the grandparents and community would say that uh, we've been looking and waiting for so long for you to come home. Kennedy and the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs outlined a list of recommendations. Manitoba has apprehended children highest, including the world, including Canada, including the province. You know, so what does that tell you? You know, the parents and the families are going through a very difficult time and that they don't know who to talk to, they don't know who to go to. The study's authors say ending infant apprehensions, supporting family unification homes, and adding community crisis centers outside CFS would help bring those numbers down. Sierra Buttons, EPTN National News, Winnipeg. An update on a story we told you about earlier this week, the first-degree murder trial of Shaden Trey Rain, now underway in Wetaskiwin, Alberta. Accused of fatally shooting 27-year-old Jeremy Suse outside a Samson Cree Nation convenience store in September 2022, Rain pled guilty yesterday to the reduced charge of second-degree murder. It carries a minimum sentence of life in prison with no chance of parole for 10 years. And finally, an Indigenous consortium is about to take ownership of the telecommunications provider Northwest Tel. Made up of Indigenous organizations from the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, 60 North Unity says the purchase price is upwards of a billion dollars. And once official, the sale will make Northwest Tel the world's largest telecommunications company to be fully Indigenous-owned. The consortium says it plans to keep Northwest Tales current management and employees. And that's your APTN News Brief for Thursday, June 13th. I'm Rick Harp.